Let's go. I think this thing's working, isn't it? Wow. I did something good there. Uh, I like candy. Well, come for Easter. Hi, yikes. I, th I thought maybe you had some in your pocket and I could kind of get it like right now. All right, well, praise the Lord. I was thinking that uh, the, gosh, where am I going to go? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we just yield ourselves as a congregation, as individuals, and I yield myself to you. And so we are in high expectation right now because we choose to believe you're going to speak to us and you're going to bring to us what we need today. In Jesus' name, amen. All the things of God, everything that uh, we read about in the Word of God is voice activated. It, it's um, it just not automatic. You know, uh, we have sprinkler systems in our yard. My, my wife has one. It's called Lonnie. But uh, it's voice activated. Yeah. It's not, there's no automatic setting in the sprinkler system Lonnie. It's always voice activated. You're going to the, you're going to water the lawn before it gets totally dead? Huh? What, what was that? Voice activated. <laughs> so it is with, with the Word of God. And I might add, all husbands are voice activated, so remember that. Um, so the Word of God is exactly like that. You have to give it voice. It, it sits here just full of the glory and power of God, all the wisdom, every gift, every pleasure, every kindness, everything God wants you to have and to be and where He wants you to go and do is all right here but it's voice activated. You have to speak out the Word of God. Let's see. Boy. Let's look at Luke chapter 12. Now, I've known that this verse has been in here for many years, but it seems this year it's really sticking out. It's, it's got to a place now where it's even in my mouth, and I'm asking for it. I'm looking for it. I want it. Luke 12, all the way down in verse 49. Jesus is speaking. He says, I came to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. I like the contemporary English version. It says, I came to set fire to the earth. You, you read on in the text here, he says that, um, do you suppose in 51 that I came to give peace on the earth? He didn't come... God manifested in the flesh that we could live the same old mediocre life and just be settled or at peace with where we're at in life. Just, well, most likely it's because we don't know any better. We don't understand the word any better. No one's told us we don't have to live this kind of life. He said, I've, I've come to make a division. I've come to make a separation. I've come to set the world on fire. I like, a, there are several translations I like. One says, I've come to hurl. I was thinking of that as I was sitting over there, and I'm reminded that a meteorite was hurled to the earth many years ago, and it exploded, and they say that's what destroyed all the dinosaurs. Well, I'm telling you this morning, Jesus has come to hurl a fiery meteorite into your life to destroy the dinosaurs. I like it. I've had dinosaurs. 
and I've heard their roar, and I've seen the flashing of their teeth, and they have been destroyed because Jesus came to do it. And other things, he says, he come to, to throw fire. Did you know when uh, they clear a field, they will throw fire or burn the stubble because it prepares the ground for fresh seed. Stubble. It's like the dinosaurs. You ever walked on stubble in, in a field? If you're barefooted, it hurts. It's pokey. Another one is he come to start a fire. His fire destroys the dinosaurs and the stubble. You could say the sin and that which holds us, that keeps us in lack and keeps us down from where we should be. Those are the thoughts in our head. The past, the things that didn't go right, the things that went wrong, the disappointments, the hurts, the pain, and on and on it goes, the shame, the failure. Those are dinosaurs. Let the fire come. Let it be hurl down, hallelujah, and destroy it. And start in you a fresh place for the seed of God. And then, of course, the last one is that he come to pour out, pour out the fire of God on us. And I want you to understand that the word fire, you know, uh, I, I like to say it because it makes me feel scholarly. The word fire in the Greek text the original languages, the articles that we so trust as the Word of God can simply mean lightning. When Paul was on the road to Damascus to strike down the way, the preaching of the Christians and getting people saved there in Damascus, it said that a light shone all around him. One translator said, lightning flashed all around him. The fire of God came into Paul's life and knocked him on his keister. There's about, this is going to be fun, there's about 500 references to fire in the Bible. And I was so excited when Pastor called me because, see, I'm going to go through all 500 this morning. <laughs> you know that's commercials you know commercials on TV because they want to sell you something preachers are no different it's, it's faster and louder you ever notice that yes. you're watching TV you're grooving all of a sudden the commercial comes whoa that's so loud because it's designed that way so if I get yelling and hollering and stuff it's designed that way if I get talking real fast it's designed that way so that you'll get something. So that when you walk away, you'll say, that little pill that does, have you ever seen that commercial? I think it's for Jardiots, right? I think it's a, a medicine. I go, wow, shut up. I'm going to listen to that all day now for a week. <laughs> no, I just want to kind of touch on some of the 90 references that are linked to God. Not all 90, just some. Okay? So the first one, fire can represent God himself. In he Hebrews 12, 29, it says, For indeed our God is a consuming fire. Yes. That quote is from Deuteronomy. Not only is he a consuming fire, it says he's a jealous God. And it's not the same kind of, it, it is connected, if you will, but I want to expand your thought on jealousy. It's just not when your, your, your wife leaves the house, whether or wherever she's going, you don't sit there and go, well, I wonder where she's going, what she's doing. What's in her text? So you're looking at her text to find out when she's not looking. Not that kind of jealousy. Not jealousy where somebody has something better in you and you're, just, you're, you're jealous over that. No, this jealousy is the jealousy of one who owns something. And when something comes into that life that he owns, God is jealous. And he says, why are you there? They belong to me. And being a consuming fire, if you would yield to him those things, 
He will burn them up because he's a jealous God. Exodus 3, 2 and 6 says that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame, the fire of a bush, and he looked, and the bush wasn't burning. And then the fire talked to Moses and said, I'm God. Take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. The fire in Scripture represents God. Fire can represent the Word of God. In Deuteronomy, it says that the Lord came from Sinai and He came down with His tens of thousands for His right hand came, for out of His right hand came a fiery law to them. Not like your word and my word. I can say, hey, I'm coming over Tuesday and then call you and say, hey, you know, stuff got in the way, I can't come over Tuesday. No, God's law, God's word is fiery. When he says it, it's just like gravity. If you jump off the top of this building, you're going down to the ground. It's a law. It's set. It's a fire that cannot be quenched. In Jeremiah in uh, 29, he says that the word of God was like a fire in my bones. And it ate at me and I could not stop it. He tried too. If you read the story of Jeremiah, he said, Whoa, Lord, this is enough. I mean, I'm talking to these stiff-necked, hard-headed people and not listening. But the Lord said, Here's my word. And it would not stop burning in Jeremiah. The fire represents the judgments of God. 2 Peter 3, 7 and 10 and 11, it says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Both earth and the works that are therein will burn up. And then he says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons are we to be? holy, and godly. Fire can represent the glory of God. Daniel, chapter 7, it says, verse 9 and 10, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. Boy, let those words paint that picture to you. Man, we don't, we, don't, we don't worship a God that's made of stone or wood or silver or gold. We worship a mighty God. His throne was fiery flame. Its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Fire represents the glory of God. Fire can represent the presence of God. Exodus 4, 38, For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. They knew the presence of God was with them because there was a fire, a pillar of fire that went before them at night. And then when the day came, uh, there was a cloud, a pillar of cloud showing his presence. The fire of God is his presence of God. And then the, the last one we want to see here is the fire can represent the power of God. Luke 3, 16 says, John answered and he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but there's one coming who I'm not worthy to even carry his shoes. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. And he went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. 
fire, power. Listen to this now, Acts 1, 5 and 8, Jesus said, now John did baptize in water, but not long from now you'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Verse 8 says, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you will be filled with power. Fire represents the power of God. It says there in Acts 2, uh, verse 3, it says, When the Holy Ghost came into the room, there was tongues as of fire on their head. I want us to look at these last three that I just described to you. The presence of God, the glory of God, and the power of God. And I want you to know that fire, glory, presence, and power are synonyms. If I use any one in a sentence or in this context, I'm talking about all three mean the same thing. If I say the power of God is in this place, the fire of God is in this place. If I say His glory is in here and it's in heavy and thick, then the fire of God is in here. Okay? Praise the living God. I'm so happy that he comes and he gives us the fire of God. Amen. There's three questions. I like what, what you, you mentioned, presence, you know, today. It was good. There's three questions I ask myself, usually all the time about Scripture and about what God is doing in my, my life or what he isn't doing. And I ask this, why am I not experiencing the fire of God? Presence. Glory, power. Is there something I can do to position myself to experience the power of God? Is it just a sovereign thing and He demonstrates His presence or His glory or His power? Or He, he comes into our lives with the fire of His self just because, nah, I want you today, not you. Maybe you, but it's up to me. No, I don't think so. I think God said, if you call on me, I will answer. He said, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Whatsoever things you ask in my name, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness. So is there something that I can do to position myself to experience this fire? And the third question is, what must I do to walk in the fire of God? So we're going to start right away with the first answer. Why am I not experiencing the fire of God? Well, I have three answers here, and these are my answers. And so if uh, any of these fit you, just sit quietly, look straight ahead. Don't give yourself away. The first reason is uh, I am not aware of His presence. The second is I am not acknowledging His presence. All these are different, though they couldn't be connected. I am distracted from His presence. In the Bible, we read many, many stories, and we find one in Luke chapter 5, verse 17, and it says that it happened on a certain day, as He was teaching, there were Pharisees, teachers of the law, sitting around, and, and come, they came from everywhere to the town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And it says the power of the Lord was present to heal them. If you read the whole story, you'll find out there were these four crazy people, four super friends, if you will, that had a crippled friend. And they said, you know what we got to do? We got to get John, I'll call him John. We got to get John over to this house where Jesus is so he can get healed. And so they brought him. They couldn't find a way in. You know, it was packed door to door. So they climbed up on the roof of this house, broke up the tiling, it says, tore a hole in it, one, one translation says, and lowered this guy down in the presence of Jesus, and he saw their faith, and fire came out and healed the man and set him free from his sins. But it gives us no record that any of those Pharisees, teachers, lawyers, all the other people packed into that house got anything 
from Jesus because they were unaware of his presence. They didn't know. They were unaware of his presence. The uh, second one here is, uh, didn't acknowledge his presence. Mark chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, it says, Jesus said, a prophet is without honor in his own country and among his own relatives. He went to Nazareth, he began to teach there, and they all said, who are you? We, we know your mom and daddy. In fact, your, your brothers and I, we, we run the streets sometimes and had some good times. And his sisters, of course I'm paraphrasing, I dated some of his sisters. Who's this guy think he is? He's just part of Joseph and Mary's house. Where does he get this wisdom and power? And it goes on to say that he could do no mighty work there except he healed a few people. They didn't acknowledge who was in their presence. They had the prophet of God, the one anointed with the Holy Ghost and fire in their presence, and they didn't acknowledge him, so they got nothing. The last one here on this first question being answered, you know, why am I not experiencing the fire of God? Well, maybe you're not aware of it. Maybe you haven't acknowledged it. And this one here is maybe you're distracted from the glory of God. Mark 4 and 19, it says that the sower went out to sow the word. Remember, the word is fire. It's the fiery law of God. It's the fire that burns in the stomach of people, in the heart of people. So the sower went out to sow the fire. And some of it fell on people who had the cares of the world and the deceitful of riches and was choked by the things they were distracted by. Just a note in case you, know, you think, well, I'm not distracted by any riches. I don't have any. <laughs> well, you still can be distracted by it. That's, a, that's an odd thought. E even though your concern or worry that you don't have enough money, it can distract you from God's ability to bless you with what you need. So next, the next question is, is there something I can do to position myself to experience the fire of God? James chapter 4 says this, humble yourselves in the sight of God and he will lift you up and resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is where you, you need to put yourself in a position. Um, I have done it for many, many years and I, I do it two ways. And you, you, don't, you don't have to necessarily do it like this but when I pray, and especially if I come to minister somewhere, and I, I want to say every time, but I, that would be exaggerating because that, that's a lot of times. But most of the time, even before I teach the simple Sunday school class at my church, I will get on my knees and put my forehead on the carpet next to the, we call it a coffee table, you know. That's where you put your coffee when you're sitting there. I do it all the time, and a little bottle of water. So I'll get on my knees and I'll purposely bow my head on the floor and say, Lord, I humble myself to you. And oft times, if I don't do that, I will do what Hezekiah did. Remember the story of Hezekiah? He had a horrible sickness. The prophet came to him and said, get your stuff in order, boy, because you're checking out. It's almost 11 o'clock and check out is 11. And he turned his face to the wall. And he cried out to God. 
So sometimes there's a, you know, I've got the front door and, and then there's a little, we, we, should, <laughs> we put our grandkids in, in that little crack there and I'd go over there and put my face in the little crack and let my touch head, my forehead touch the door and the little wall and say, Lord, I, I just humble myself. I ask for your help. I need you so desperately. Put in me what you want me to say. And so that is how you position yourself for the fire of God, for the presence of God. You got to be aware of it. You got to acknowledge it, right? You got to set aside distractions. What did he say in Hebrews chapter 12? Let us lay aside all those weights that easily uh, distract us, those sins that distract us. You got to set those things aside and humble yourself under the hand of God and He will exalt you. Yeah, just humble yourself. And then what must I do to walk in the fire of God? Well, I already talked about it really. You have to seek God. Doesn't that, that almost sounds like what? Isn't God everywhere? All the time? In every place? Yes. Is He with you wherever you go, whenever you go there? At whatever time it is, it, it doesn't matter? Yes. Is, is He down in, in the tavern right now while they're having Bloody Marys? Yes. Is He here? Yes. Is He in the Capitol building? I suppose there's no representatives there, but there's people who are cleaning and working. Is He there with them? Yes. But He's of no effect because nobody's seeking Him. I, I, think, I, told, I think I told this story at camp meeting. But I had a, a friend who was in a bar with a, another drunk, my friend, a backslidden Christian. The drunk and him are arguing, is God real? And my, my friend said, well, of course, yeah. go, 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 go. God's real. And he said, I don't believe it. Well, the drunk had a growth on his arm right there in front of him, a growth. I don't know what it was. My friend said, let me prove to you God is real. And put his hand on the growth, and the growth disappeared under his hand. And the drunk said, Oh, God is real. Let's get another beer for my friend here. <laughs> See, the, the situation you're in, God is present. Now, my friend has since repented and come and, and is in full honor with God, you know, so don't think that he's still at the tavern healing people. I'll just give that as an illustration that God is present no matter where you are. And he is not manifest, his fire is not blazing, is because you're not seeking him. You're not looking for him. You're not asking for him to come and help you. In Ephesians chapter 6, it says that we need to pray all kinds of prayers in the Spirit and call upon God and make supplication for, for your needs and for people. When you do that, the power of God comes. The glory of God comes. That's why in a, here in a church service is so needful for you to experience God. Not that this is the place where it's limited to. I think I already made that clear. But when you come here with a heart to seek after God, to hear His voice, then His fire will be manifest to you. His presence will be made aware to you. So you pray, and you pray in the Spirit, and you seek God, and you seek His things, and you seek His Word. Acts 4.29, it says, you, they were just beaten and set free. Remember in Acts 3, they, uh, the crippled man was at the gate, beautiful there, and they prayed for him, and he got healed. And then those two, John and Peter, were brought before the religious leaders, and they said, hey, what are you doing talking this name of Jesus and talking about resurrection. And Peter said, dudes, there's no other name in heaven to be saved and healed and set free. So we're just going to disregard what you say and do what God says. And so they whipped them 
and set them out of the way. And then they went to their own company, to their own people, and they got in a prayer meeting. And they said, Lord, you see all the threatening. You see all this stuff. Now grant to your servants boldness. And what, what were they? Well, let's, let's go over there. It's so awesome. What were they looking for when they prayed for boldness? Look at this here. It's Acts chapter 4. Verse 29, they say, Now look, Lord, on their threats, and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak the fire. Remember I said? It's a synonym. The word is fire. They said, Give us boldness to speak your word, to speak the fire. By stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God in boldness. They were not only praying that God would be present with them, but they were praying that He would be present in such a way that there would be manifestations of healing and signs and wonders. Yeah. Wherever they were, He wanted that. I think Pastor Mike has been doing some things for a few years now, how he, he just is aware of the presence of God where He is, and He'll pray for people out of the blue, and things will happen for Him. There's a boldness that you can ask for. You can ask for boldness. Amen. Ask for it. Amen. I mean, sometimes, you know, like I say, I, I, I'll get down and I'll pray. I'll say, Lord, I, I'm just as about as weak as they get. I don't think I could hold the Holy Ghost in a wet paper, ba wet paper bag right now. But I'm asking you to give me boldness, that I would speak beyond my age, beyond my place, beyond who I am that I would speak the fire of God. And 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, let's turn there. I know what it says. It's so good to read it. We want the fire of God in our lives. I think uh, if I can paraphrase what Ryan Holt Bonke said, you ever heard of the great evangelist? He was called the great evangelist of Africa. Millions came to Christ under his ministry there. He said, if the church does not have the supernatural power of God, the fire of God, then it's going to have to up its bake sales, programs, and playgrounds to draw people. We need the fire of God. There has to be something about you, something that is incredibly uh, irresistible to people. I just can't go in life with these good looks. I need more than that. Pastor struggles with it. He knows. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says this, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts but especially that you may prophesy. Let, let me give you another translation. Be hard after my love. In fact, if, if we would look at it, this is in a imperative language, meaning it's a command. He's telling you, I command you, be hard after my love. And that you would be boiling over, hot with desire for the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, especially that you may speak or prophesy the mind of the Spirit in the earth. You want the, the fire of God to be manifest in your life? Well, you're going to have to be aware of it. And it's, it's not, you know, if someone comes into the room, if you're just sitting there and someone comes in the room 
from behind hide you, you can be aware of that. You know that. But that person can be in the room and use the word, give you no benefit because you don't acknowledge that person. You have to be aware that the presence, the fire is here, and then you have to acknowledge that it's here, and then you have to decide, I'm going to set every distraction aside that I may have the full enjoyment of the fire of God. And then you bring yourself to a place of humility, and you, you call out to God, and you seek God, and He will answer you, and He will give to you boldness if you ask for it. So that's, that's all I want to say this morning. Hallelujah. Is that the, the fire, the presence of God, the glory of God, and the power of God is present with us right now. And we can enjoy all of it because we are his sons and his daughters. We should give ourselves to it. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we're so thankful for your word. And I believe we'll heed it. And it'll roll around in our hearts for days after this. It'll poke at us. It'll say, hey, do you remember? Yield yourself to me. Hey, don't let that distract you. Look over here. Acknowledge me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let it be as a fire in our bones. Let us not be able to escape it. Let us be full of your Spirit. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Well, brother, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <clears throat> Hallelujah.